Greetings, and welcome to the Still TV News. I'm your host, Terrence Brown, and today I have the pleasure and honor of interviewing West College Professor of Music and Band Director on evolution of the Black R&B and Hip Hop since the 1990s. Greetings and welcome before we hop straight into these questions. In terms of Black R&B and Hip Hop, which was the best era within the last 30 years and why? Um, as far as hip-hop and R&B, you can have two for each, well, one for each genre. So who, who was the best for? Yeah. Okay, okay. So as far as R&B, who was the best for last 30 years? I'm going to have to go with Beyonce. I say Beyonce because uh, I feel like she's an extension of Michael Jackson, uh, especially with the Beyonce album, the Lemonade album, that she uh, is continuing to push the envelope on, you know, creating um, videos for every song concept and just delivering content that, you know, nobody else is actually doing. And as far as hip-hop, I'm going to have to go with Kanye West, surprisingly. Now, because I, I say Kanye West, I know he's going through a lot of stuff right now, but towards the beginning of his uh, career, um, especially he was gangster rap heavy, and to see this college kid showing up with a pink polo and a book bag, I kind of related to that because myself, I, I wanted to go to college, and, and this is the material that, you know, was more closely aligned to me besides, you know, the more gangster rap or drug-related rap or street rap, because, you know, everybody doesn't do that. And other things that he did was um, incorporated Jordans. He actually brought the Jordans back that were coming out of fashion at that time. Uh, the way that he sampled music with the high pitch like through the wire. And also um, the 808s and heartbreaks with the minimalistic uh, beat maker, which all the producers are actually right now using. There's a lot of things that Kanye incorporated that he used in hip hop, but uh, because of his shenanigans, <laughs> right, he's kind of being, uh, being negative. Okay, and what is your favorite song by Beyonce and Kanye West? Let me mention those two. Let's see, my favorite, I have to pick one. Surprisingly, I like the, uh, for Beyonce, it probably had to be the, uh, the first track that was on uh, Destiny's Child, a uh, release for Men in Black, um, Killing Time. Uh, it, it was just a piece that stuck out to me. That was my first introduction to her. And that, you know, that kind of, kind of the apex, you know, my discovery of her. And for Kanye West, I'm gonna have to go with uh, the power. Just the sample, everything from the drums, the, the, the sample voice, to the guitar solo, it was just, it's a masterpiece. I think, you know, 50, 100 years from now, let's say we listen to it, trying to figure out the cipher, what it was actually trying to do. Okay. And in your opinion, who was the most influential artist of this era, if they're different, and why? Influential? Yeah. There's so many people doing so many great things, but I, I'm going to have to go back to the two people that I spoke of, because um, they, they will be in the history. So, I mean, 20, 40, 100 years from now, we will be discussing um, the accomplishments, especially if you obviously with our album, videos, Kanye, early career, uh, sampling techniques, incorporating the hip hop, pushing the album, or bringing other type of people, you know, book bag rap or uh, people with college degrees rap. It's just it's a whole nother um, generational view right now because anybody can do anything. There's no labels, there's no um, genre that you can actually stick to. But one other person that does come to mind uh, is probably why it be Drake, the more I think about it, because uh, he's not necessarily hip hop all the way, he's not necessarily R&B, he kind of walks from both sides of that, that spectrum. So he can give you an R&B track where he sings the entire time, and he can give you a hip hop track where he wants somebody. So it's kind of a new idea, so. Okay. And um, how have they, how do you believe they have influenced the music industry today? Music industry. Um, it's just so many things. Uh, so far, the music industry is just a total product, you know, with the whole idea of the 360 video. So everything from the way that you carry yourself on the music, the outside, you know, the social media, to the way that you interact with your fans, um, it's getting to a point where I would, I, in my opinion, I feel like it's going to be more from artist to fan um, distribution as far as music and uh, content 
social media, um, just so more direct to consumer products. Uh, because with the industry, it's so much taxation, you know, lawyer fees, and contracts, and you got to pay producers. And so what can you do to get the content for the artists to fans as quick as possible so you can actually have a connection? Instead of going through the whole, you know, waiting for the album to right. drop, and waiting for the video, you can just get it the next day. Right. And um, what excites you most about these two artists? It's, like, it's just they continue to push the envelope on just the, the boundaries, the status quo, uh, especially with Kanye, you know, incorporating more gospel uh, with the choir and uh, more sampling more gospel music and just bringing the, the idea of you know, Christianity back to the forefront. I feel like it's always been there, but it just hasn't had necessarily been a cool thing to talk about. Right. Everything from Jesus Walk to his last album, which is still, I think, one of the billboard for a gospel album, surprisingly. Beyonce, I, I think that she's going more pro-black, especially with the Lion King and um, with the situation that's going on with African Americans in America. Um, we just need to talk about and let folks know that you know we're not a pushover. We're not um, just going to let anything happen, and that um, we we just want to make sure that you're consistent. And I, and I feel like to Americans, anybody. If you want to do a certain thing to one group of people, uh, as black people, I think we'll be more open and receptive if we see that happen to everybody. It's like the situation at the Capitol. We know that with Black Lives Matter, <laughs> right. we'd be having a whole bunch of folks face on T-shirts, and you know, all because they were not African American. You know, we feel like it's not um, received in the same way. And I feel like you know, just be consistent. If you're gonna do one thing to one group, make sure you do it to everybody. You ain't gonna do it to everybody. Don't do it to African Americans. So I think we can figure that part out. And you know, she's speaking through that to that situation through her music. So that would make it very interesting. Okay. And I noticed that you mentioned Kanye and his concert choir. <laughs> um, so I know that's something new and something that's trending um probably on all social medias right now because I think that's one of the biggest comebacks that he has had for his music so far. So um, with that being said, um, have you listened to any of his pieces? And if so, uh, what were your favorite from all those pieces? Uh, I know that he just finished with the opera. Uh, I know that he has a, a huge, um, based on a biblical a scripture, a uh, whole stage operation. And, and I, I actually uh, watched it. And it's just the whole idea that you bring in the idea of, you know, the role of classical opera. You bring in uh, Christian values in today's um, contemporary sound, especially with R&B, hip hop, gospel. You just mix it all, all into one. So you can tell he's a student of music history. He understands the idea of Mozart and Bach and what they were to Western culture. And he's just trying to do the same thing at least today. So we incorporate right. everything that came before him and all the situations that's going on now to pass into the future. He's that you know vessel, but I, I think he just you know because of social media, everything is so instant. So if he says something or does something that people don't agree with, it's you know uh, strikes negatively against his accomplishments, and that's one of the things I feel like is a downfall of social media because we don't know um, with Mozart, his <laughs> right. free time or with Bach, so they, they could have been just as extreme, but we have no idea because you know social media is a that you only. Right. Know the things that they pay us down to us. So we need to make sure that we also be there too for ours. Instead of you know picking out the things that we don't like, we need to figure out who we actually can like and actually can pass down and um, you know stay with the positive vibe. Right. right. So also, I noticed that you mentioned Beyonce and her uh, features and the Lion King. I watched Lion King probably about the first ten minutes and then I fell asleep. And I don't know if that's just me, but when I'm going into a movie theater, I'm going to immediately fall asleep. So with that being said, um, what do you think was the most influential song from The Lion King that she has sang? Because I know there's a lot of singing in the new movie. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Um, me personally, from the album, I don't know. I'm trying to think back to, I don't even think I, I watched the new movie. <laughs> so I, I guess I grew up with the cartoon movie, and you know, I'm with, 
I, I don't know if I want to ruin it. <laughs> the cartoon movie, but I, I did listen to an album. I know it's a song um, about Star. I can't think of the title right now, but it just captured, you know, the the essence, you know, being in the minor mode, uh, dark, almost, you know, creeping in, um, very melodious. It, it just it captured his whole essence, and um, and, and I feel like. You know, I think she's doing a good job of trying to uh, assimilate herself into the idea of the Lion King, but at the same time, it's just, it's a classic movie. And, and I think for that instance, it's going to be a kind of a big separation, especially from the cartoon that we made in our album. Um, so the message was good. I, I just, the way it was delivered, yeah. like you said, I, I don't think it was very well connected. The idea is great, but the execution. I, I think we can find another way to execute it or for the next project, make sure that you know it's something for everybody. Absolutely. And I most definitely agree with you. So I see that we got a little bit off track, but we're gonna go ahead and get back on track. So what are some of the major changes that you've seen in the music industry within the last 30 years? Um again social media. Uh, social media is becoming a, a huge tool. For the positive, and it's used to for the negative. Right. Like again, if you use it for the positive, you can constantly build, uh, uh, constantly put up content each and every day, see your fan base connect through comments, shares, likes, all social media platforms. But again, if something happens that is in a negative view, I don't know, it's something uh, about our culture that we, we kind of relinquish, we, we kind of we yeah, have a thrill off the negativity. So, you know, anything that gets out that's negative, we, we won't put that at the top. So, so with Beyonce or anybody else, um, any negative situation, that probably the number one most viewed thing, but everything else comes second to that. So, you need to make sure that, you know, you're always in a good light. You got to make sure that you know how to treat folks because uh, you don't know who has a camera out nowadays. So, you might be in the street talking to one person crazy. And all of a sudden, you turn around and somebody is filming that situation. So, you know, you got to treat people right no matter where you are. And that goes from somebody that's, you know, a, a child to a superstar. Okay. So, you got to make sure that everybody is in a positive way. Okay. And um, I know that we're talking about like positive lights of certain artists and things. Do you recall any artists from today that have been brought to a bad light or a, in a negative light? Um, I don't know, the only thing that comes to mind is probably Michael Jackson. You know, even with the court cases with the situations with all his happenings before his passing, I don't think anything was actually, um, um, it was, I know it was accused, but actually pinned or say that he actually did it. So it was just the whole idea of him going through it and say and people saying that this happened to him. But when you go to the court of law and you know proving yourself as innocent, you know we still hold that against them. So I, I don't know. We need to make sure if you go through the process, due process, and you're proven innocent, that we, we should release or uh, separate you from those allegations. But you know, with people negativity, it sells better for some reason. So. Other than him, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a lot more artists, but um, we just need to make sure that we. I feel like music is music. Um, it capture a moment of time. It can, it can translate or uh, transcend from generation to generation, and you know we need to pass on the best parts of today to our, our, our children, our students, uh, and just let them know that you know we, we have something to say today. You know, I mean. And I definitely have to agree with that because Michael Jackson, I believe, he was one of the most influential artists of probably around the 2000s, mm -hmm. maybe because that's where a lot of um, his popular music, well, at least for me, mm -hmm. has risen, such as Butterfly, um, is that much. So, mm -hmm. with that being said, um, what do you think? How do you think Michael Jackson has influenced the music today? Um, my personal opinion is he is the 
catalyst and genesis towards uh, contemporary R&B. So um, historically, uh, R&B, you could say, became a genre in the late 1940s. It started off as race music. So it was a separation between pop music of that time and black music. So the pop music would be like jazz groups, jazz combos, you know, Duke Ellington, uh, swing bands at that time, and um, any type of black artist, uh, especially if it was just blues, but like the guitar and the singer by itself, then you add the rhythm section and bass, and this is where you get the rhythm and blues from. So uh, that category from the 40s took off, like Little Richards, uh, Sam Cooke, and um, Michael Jackson with the whole lot of music video. So he had the bad video, he had Thriller, which was a short movie, short film, and it just catapulted him from on being to pop. So um, I feel like with black artists, you know, we're trying to figure out why we got to separate ourselves. <laughs> you know, I feel like hip hop is a part, you know, rap is a part of hip hop, and a lot of people want to separate the two. And a lot of people want to separate pop music from R&B, where I feel like R&B is a variation of pop music. So it's just, it's, I, I think in the whole Western culture out here, we want to put everything in a different category. And I feel like, you know, especially with black culture, everything is one and the same. And I have to agree with that. So thank you for those interesting answers. Mm -hmm. However, I believe this is the time for us to go on break. So we will see you all back on the Spill TV News after this short break. Welcome back to the Spill TV News. I'm your host, Terrence Brown, and today I have the pleasure and honor of interviewing Mr. Byron Chapman, Professor of Music here at West College. Welcome back. So to continue with our interview, what is different about the production of music today since the 1990s? Hmm. Um, I'm gonna have to start off with the 1990s. I feel like it was more of a group project. Uh, if you go look at the album covers and uh, the people who are actually on the track, who are making these uh, songs and instrumentals, you may have one person on drums, somebody else on keyboards, uh, totally different for the uh, person for the producer. Then you have a, a, a artist, somebody doing lyrics. So it was an actual group project with a lot of input. And I feel like with the new artists today, it's kind of more limited, so you might have just one person doing the instrumental. Um, artists probably write the lyrics themselves, so probably have a, uh, a team of people to work on it, but it, it's kind of uh, a cut down on, on number on how many people are actually working on a song. Like, for example, let's look at um, Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> yeah. So this was an entire band. It was almost 20, 30 people playing instruments and recording, and, and those were just the people that were, you know, instrumentalists. So you had people on the backside, again, lyrics, content, you know, production. So it was, you know, a group project, a group affair. And again, I think nowadays, you, you know, a lot of people are going to go to producers, uh, DJ Mustard, or uh, 808 Mafia, <laughs> and, you know, getting these instrumentalists from who were made by one person and the artists, um, usually they write, again, write the lyrics themselves as a team, and you know, straight to production. So I say you know, the size of uh, production teams. Okay. And um, I know that you noticed um, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to know is, um, what kind of in instruments have they used on the uh, production and when they are creating their music? What kind of instruments do they use? So usually uh, live uh, instruments, so um, these different groups like Earth, Wind and Fire, Cameo, I believe it or not, these groups actually met up at schools of music like Juilliard and um, Eastman. And um, so this was a whole group of African American students who were uh, musicians who were top notch. They got together and actually started performing the music, started touring. So this, these were live performances. So you're setting up the microphone, maybe a uh, one in the center, or a left, right, uh, dual mic, and you're, you're just recording the session. So if you listen to the, um, you know, early 80s, 70s, and early 90s, these are live recordings versus today where everything is production. You can go in and record just the drums, you can go in and record just the piano. And it kind of takes the, the edge off of it. It's more polished sounding, but it's not necessarily that vibe. 
And I think you're trying to get back and return to the vibe. Um, I, I feel like now, especially with R&B, you know, it's not necessarily a melody or necessarily content that it, it just wants you to put you in a particular type of mood. So I think music has, you know, shifted and uh, from live instruments to acoustic, we're we still trying to figure out how to live, no matter live or acoustic, or live or electronic. Okay. And do you think that depend, uh, dependency or independency play a part in uh, why so many bands aren't as big as Earth, Wind, and Fire? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily dependency. It's, um, I think, in the early army or early, uh, they, especially with black music, I think you were more excited about just um, getting the record out, more excited about performing, more excited about going on tour, connecting with the fans. And uh, when the whole idea of copyright, um, money cuts, or uh, who's making the money, how many percentages going to the, the headliner versus the actual band, and you know, it, 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 it breaks up groups so money, it's probably the biggest situation. It breaks up, you know, large bands. And I feel like nowadays, especially with the music industry, we're touring. <laughs> it's totally cut out because of the pandemic. We had to find other avenues. And uh, people are trying to figure out how to make this money themselves. So I don't know if you want to be in a group and, you know, you do a, a, a social media concert and you want to make a couple thousand, you got to divide it among 30 folks. But, you know, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, figure out how to do it yourself, get your own. Um, program software, Logic, or Pro Tools, get your own mics, get your own keyboard, and just do it yourself so you can make sure that you have a return on your, your product. Instead of, you know, I, I feel like it will return, but you just gotta push through this situation. Right, absolutely. And um, comparing your outlooks of music since the 1990s, so how has it evolved over the years? Um, let me see. I say that that's when we get like like we said earlier, Michael Jackson. Uh, that's when we was with Quincy Jones. Then after that, we have a, a big push for um, New Jack Swing. Um, so I, I think that took over for a little while. So this when we had hip hop music, but we had like R and B chord progression and singers with Mary J. Blige, you know, Casey and JoJo. Then uh, this is when we also had to take off with the boy bands, you know, uh, more. Uh, Boys to Men, we have uh, After Seven, um, the, the re uh, introduction of The Temptations. I know my, my father's a big fan of the, 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 the current <laughs> group, so he kind of follows them. So it, it's just a progression. It's just whatever the times fall for. You know, whatever's hot at the time. We're going to figure it out. So I mean, right now, you know, 808s and, and snares, mm -hmm. and we just put the, uh, you know, R&B or gospel chords on top, and this is where you get Scissor and um, you know, the new R&B flavor, so a still just hip hop drums, nice progression, nice vibe, nice content, and you know, push forward. Okay. And I noticed that you mentioned Mary J. Blige and SZA. I know SZA is one of the, probably the most influential artists of this age, mm -hmm. and uh, Mary J. Blige was as well. So. Could you give us a comparison on how you view these two artists and what are your favorite songs between these two artists? Um, I don't know, I feel like they're similar. They are capturing capturing the idea of both hip hop and RB. So, you know, with the Mary J. Blige, that's, that's the one with the, the bad boy era. And you got the heavy drum patterns, uh, piano jams, you know, it's kind of still gritty with the uh, New York sound, but you know, she's still able to produce uh, uh, almost gospel-like texture on top of chords. You know, and, and it's very, uh, when you hear it, you know what it is. And um, even today with SZA, I know with other female singers who will really stick out today, but just again, um, with the ALA drum set, um, especially with the bass sound or New Orleans bound sound or uh, especially with the Memphis, Memphis uh, trap sound. A lot of people don't know that that actual trap sound came from Memphis, they yeah. relocated to Ohio. And just take those sounds and again, put uh, gospel or jazz chords on top and have an R&B singer, it's just a, a totally different vibe. Absolutely. And uh, who do you think is the most influential artist from the uh, 2020 um, and 2010 era? 
Then, you know, went all out to LA, had a little situation, got in jail, and shit and I got him out, you know, the whole um, death row movement. But uh, one other movement was going on that I think a lot of people tend to overlook. I want to say it was the 95, um, it was an award show. This was the award show when they were beefing, and this is when Snoop Dogg and um, Shit and I came to the mic and talking about uh, Bad Boy. You know, you want your, your producer all in the video, and you know, you don't want all that to come to death row. And then the, I know the, the album of the year actually went to Outkast. And Outkast came up there and they're like, you know, everybody talking about this and that about the East Coast, West Coast, because the South had something to say. So that was the, the introduction for music from the South. So. It was a whole lot of things going on, but I think it was out, you know, overshadowed with the beef. And um, you know, if you look at it more in detail, they were friends, Biggie and Tupac knew each other. They, you know, Jay Z and Nas knew each other, but it was just the whole competitiveness of who had the best lyrics, best album, and you know, respect for each other. So um, just being a, a student, being a, a child, listening to the albums and you know, replay and trying to decipher what they were talking about was very interesting because, you know, it was a whole process on, on its own. And I feel like today's music, I don't know, I'm not really feeling the whole, cause I'm like, as far as like beef and uh, I think the last one was Nas and uh, Meek Mill, and, you know, and they, they got shut down by Jay Prince, but it was like, I don't know, it's just hip hop is not necessarily the same, you know. And I, and I feel like again, more respect, you know, get mentors, learn the history, show respect to the craft, and push the envelope. So, you know, what can we do big? What can we do next? What are we doing with it? We shouldn't be making the same song over and over again. <laughs> right. And um, what are your views on John Legend and Eric Badu? Hmm. Um, John Legend. Now, the interesting thing that, that sticks out to me about John Legend, um, you know, he actually went to college <laughs> and, you know, he started pursuing his uh, music career after, you know, he got all his students. So, you know, he, he sticks out as a performer, but, you know, I, I relate to him because, you know, that, that path, you know, some days I wake up and like, man, I think I could do that, but I can be a performer. So, I relate to him as, you know, the, the mentor in the distance. And Erica Badu, believe it or not, um, the thing that connects me with her is that you know she was in the band, she went to Grammar, yeah, yeah. HBCU, uh, plays TBS, uh, and also she is um, one of the, I wouldn't say proud, but, but one of the few people uh, in the whole, what is it, the, the uh, D'Angelo, the, what is that? That, that job, it's a whole job in by itself. Uh, uh, Neo Soul, yeah, okay. uh, um, Jill Scott, and you know, uh, you use some live instruments, almost like a, a smoky cast type of thing, late night. Um, all of them on the mic, the music is extra slow, and you just vibe, yeah. you know. And, and that music has a special place for me with, with Neo Soul because it, it captures, um, just so much. I feel like Neo Soul is the sound of the night, in my personal opinion. Um, so it's just, you know, that's the power of music. You can listen to something and go back to a, a special time in your life or what you were doing at that age or who you was talking to. So it's just so many new memories caught up in, you know, in those, you know, 90 years ago. So take me back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay, well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for coming out to the Spill TV News. It's been interesting meeting with you, and I just want to thank you once again for coming out. Um, thank you all for t uh, tuning in to the Spill TV News. I'm your host, Terrence Brown, and we will see you all again soon.